Welcome to the Melanin Jelly Project Conversations, a podcast that celebrates diversity and representation in children's storytelling, entertainment, and edutainment. I am the host, Olunos and Luisa Ivaze. On this podcast, I chat with authors and creators of children's books, entertainment, and edutainment. This is also a collaboration with the Ottawa Black Book Club. Thank you for also following and watching episodes of the podcast. So... My name is Oluna St. Luisa Ibaze. I'm a writer. I write mainly for adults and recently started writing for children. So when I started writing for children, I, re- I discovered, I noticed a gap mm-hmm. in podcasts that talk about representation and diversity. I like that on your profile, it says you are committed and passionate about creating authentic and refreshing Black British animated children's content that will play a significant role in promoting a positive representation for culturally curious families in Britain and globally. So, right. Zainab, tell <laughs> me about yourself and what inspired you to start Zaz yes. Production Works. Okay, uh, so um, I'm Zainab, I'm based in the UK, um, to be precise, east of England, Norwich. So I'm a creative producer, scriptwriter, and also the creator and um, or founder, should I say, of, of Zaza Production Works and the creator of the animated series, The Adventures of Zaza. Um, so my background is, so for my first degree, I did um, programming and then for my master's animation. So I do have a background in animation. Okay. Um, and that was like the catalyst to starting the company mm-hmm. and the show that I'm currently working on amongst other in development. Um, so the reason why I started, so many reasons, obviously the obvious ones, the lack of diversity, um, but also for me, I'm passionate about it. Um, but there was one incident that was kind of like the incident, like you could say, um, the, the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, when um, Frozen came out. Okay. The, 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 yeah. Um, I went to see a friend in Bristol with another friend who had a little girl. Um, so we're getting ready to go out and I was dressing her up and I was doing her hair. Um, and she started crying that she hates her hair. She wants her hair like um, one of the characters in um, Disney. And I think it was about four or five at the time. And that was a very challenging moment. So imagine trying to explain to a child, oh, you can't have your hair like that because the texture it's not the same but she wasn't having it she was just screaming and crying my hair is ugly i want my hair like i think elsa at the time is the, elsa, that's the yeah. Yeah. yeah so she kept crying and crying and crying and for me at that moment i guess i can say that that was the defining moment of i guess it's time to kind of let's talk more action basically so that's when um because i already started doing work on my show but that was when i decided to kind of go full time and dedicate everything i have to it and that was since 2018 but yeah for me that was like yeah as i said the final um yeah the final push i needed so yeah oh that's great and um why african folk tales because if you are doing a production remember yeah as much as we we do things from a place of passion we also remember that it's a business that's right <laughs> and yeah. we are looking at and thinking of what sells why right. we push you what we are passionate about so why african folk tales well i guess to be authentic i had to kind of embed my experience so when i was in nigeria i grew up around um grandparents aunties and uncles who told us stories that were embedded like in african folk tales and had morals and values and i don't know if you remember there was a time in nigeria where we had a tv show called tales by moonlight yes. and that was heavily based around folk tales and that had a huge impact on my upbringing yeah. and um when I was doing my master's, actually, it was one of my lecturers that was like, why don't you do, because I wanted to do something else. He was like, you know, you guys have so many rich stories. Why don't you try exploring one of them? So it was from there. And then I realized, oh, wow, there's like a huge market. And the idea is to kind of take what we already have and kind of revamp it and kind of make it fit into the modern society. Because a lot of our folk tales are very... Um, yeah, they're a bit brutal for that age group. So, um, and for me, also was a challenge to see how I can take what we already have and kind of change it slightly different, and also embed some of my British experience into it. So, yeah, um, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, why I, I remember. 
as a, I mean, as a child growing up in the 80s, I remember Tales by Moonlight. And yes. up north, we also had Magana Ajariche. That's right, I remember. Yes, the parrots, yes, that would tell stories. And I remember when I wanted to, I was thinking of writing for kids because I'm not a children's writer. That's what I've always told myself. <laughs> when I started writing for children, I can't seem to stop so I can finish up my adult manuscripts. I was thinking, Louisa, what do you write about? You know, children, how do you find your, <laughs> your, 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 your child voice? And then I remember that I'm a history junkie. I love history. At the back there, you see, that's my enchanted bookshelf. And those are my children's, those are my children's books. In fact, this one, this morning, was just nominated oh, as a goodness. finalist for Best Book Award. So I'm going to start, I'm going to have to put it out for votes. But yeah, but <laughs> yeah. I thought, you know, Louisa, why not write about history? Since you love history, I'll show you some of my work. So I started with my first book, Crowning Glory, which I was where I was talking about just African hair its significance, the significance of African hairstyles and all of that. And then for book two, because it's a series called Africa is Not a Country. So for, for this one, this one is the African safari where I'm introducing kids to yeah. Africa's indigenous animals. Yeah, so that's why I decided to do that. But when I, I thought, I looked at it and I thought, there are things I would like to do with this book. Not just tell stories. I want to tell stories I did, I went as far as getting character dolls. Yes, I did that. Yeah, I did that. And then a friend tried to get me in contact with somebody who does animation in the US. And he was asking okay. if the stories were written as a book or I had written a script. So what are some of the challenges you have experienced or encountered <laughs> in the process oh my God. of putting um, African content out there for kids? Okay, um, so when I first started, um, I guess I was fortunate because when I was doing my master's, one of the modules we did was to do it like running a creative business. Okay. So that kind of um, helped me from the get go to see that my idea is not just a creative idea, it has to be able to translate into a business language. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess in a way, not being able to start early as I had expected has given me the chance to really do a lot of groundwork. I've done so much research. I've taken online courses on running a business, how to write stories, and not just how to write stories, but how to kind of make it um, relatable to today's kids, because obviously today's kids don't think like we do. Mm -hmm. And also I've done um, so many research, even in the way we write our script, because I'm very passionate about African storytelling and doing research on how I can apply that onto the, um, the script writing process. So I've, I've read up a lot on African storytelling, um, how to even use storytelling in general and, and apply that to the script. I've even kind of come up with a formula and how I can em embed like the Western way of storytelling and also our structure and style of storytelling like together when doing the script writing. So I have some kind of a formula. Um, that in itself initially was a challenge because when I first, as you um, asked me before, why folk tales? Yeah. Uh, when I first started, um, I realized that, um, that so what I realized when I first started was like, yes, folk tales is fun, but then how do you make it engaging for today's modern kids? So that in itself was a challenge, and that's what kind of helped me, or that's what kind of prompted me to do a lot of research on how I can apply that to modern uh, modern days kids. But then along the way, I read so many books. As you can see, I have so many books here. And um, what I also found out was there were so many African folk tales in the Western world, but they were written by um western people who have gone into those african different african countries mm -hmm. and have taken the stories but in the process of translating it um it's kind of lost its flavor because you know we have our way of Essence. telling us we yes. have our way yeah. of telling stories yeah, yeah. the rhythm the style and everything so when you're reading it it's just yeah it doesn't have that that rhythm so mm -hmm. that in itself like was how do i bridge that gap like okay. telling the story that regardless of where you are in the world you can relate to mm -hmm. but also keeping that authenticity of how we tell our stories so that's where the research came in and then some of the challenges obviously is um running a capital in intensive business like animation that in itself um trying to get access to funding um especially 
now that UK or should I say Britain is out of EU, the funding pot is like really small now. Um, and then also being a black person, because when I first started, I've had people telling me, oh, it's never going to work here, go back to Nigeria. And that was my initial plan. I actually went back to Nigeria for like two years after my master's to see how I can start. And I realized that in itself like has its own <laughs> challenges. So when I came back, um, before the whole pandemic, obviously not a lot of people were interested in black content. Yeah. Um, so I was trying to kind of get myself out there, but since the pandemic, um, there's been some interest but it's still kind of challenging in itself mm -hmm. because one of the challenges that i'm facing is like yes people want content from minority groups but i feel they need to understand that if we're going to tell our story we have to be allowed to tell it in a way that's so different to what's already out there because as I mentioned, the style of how we tell our stories, the languages that we use, um, even the personality and how we tell our stories, the rhythm, it's just, yeah, so those are the challenges. It's like taking our story and still trying to fit it into how the existing content are out there. And I feel like in the course of a game of doing that, that would dumb it down. So that in itself, it's a challenge, but I think we're still kind of getting there. I'm trying to find that balance. Okay. Well, that's the question. <laughs> because, because I, I, mean, I was looking through your profile and I saw that you had worked at EVCL. So, oh, yeah, that's right. Yes, when I was yeah. at yeah. Yes, Adamu Waziri was the very first person guest I interviewed. Just to ask him oh, yeah. about, okay. you know, yes, why African content, the challenges, and, you know, the yeah. challenges of running a business in Nigeria. Because I'm thinking of mm -hmm. electricity, I'm thinking of marketing, getting it on TV stations. Yeah, because I tried yes. to find yours, and I was wondering, is it on YouTube, the, uh, the Adventures oh, so, of No, not yet. So we're still in development. So um, I don't know if you've seen, so that, that this particular series, The Adventures of Sarah, is in co-production partnership with a, a company called Argo Films and one of the executive producers is Richard Jones and then David Oyelowo, Yoruba Saxon. So we're still kind of working on it. So it's in development. So once yeah. we have the content, because we're still working on stuff behind the scenes. So when it's ready, we'll be out there. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so how did that come about? How did that collaboration come about? Because when I saw it, I went, wow. Because a lot of people yeah. listening who are interested in going into animation, will be wondering how did she get that because sometimes you see people see it's like i run a book club here and the book yeah. club is called the ottawa black book club so we are focused on books by authors of african and black descent and we meet on the last saturdays of every of every month from january to to november and you know we meet for just two hours everything goes smoothly but people don't know or understand the background work that goes into that I have to do all month for just those two hours. <laughs> so people will be curious to know how did you come about that collaboration? How did that happen? <laughs> yeah. First of all, I'm gonna say God. Like <laughs> I truly believe that when you prepare the opportunity like kind of presents itself. So how mm -hmm. that came about was um I was part of like an investment program and um, my advisor at the time was like oh i know someone that is very interested in an up and coming filmmakers i'd like to introduce you to him okay. and the way it happened was so straight we we're literally in the queue getting our lunch and i was kind of briefly pitching my idea to him that was richard jones okay. and he was like okay sounds interesting um send me some documents so i sent him some documents he was still so the conversation like we had a few conversations one of them was really strange so he was on the train on the way to London, I was on the coach about to get to Heathrow because I was flying to New York and we were just having a conversation because he was like, oh, so what do you need? And I was kind of telling him what I needed and stuff like that. So we were just conversating about the program, um, should, I, should I say the series and stuff. And then even when I was in New York, we had a few conversations and then I was like, oh, I think there's someone that is interested. And I was like, okay, who is it? Then he was like, um, 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 give me a few uh, weeks, I'll get back to you. And then he called me and said, oh yeah, so then, um, you know, David, oh, you know, what's up, what's I do? He said, well, he's interested. I was like, what? And it was like right in the, I think the height of the pandemic. Um, okay. 
we had a few conversations and he was like yeah i'm very interested your show has potentials and he asked me a few questions he said yes i'd like to be on board i was like of course like why not so um since then like a lot has happened and um yeah um a lot in a good way and i've learned so much about how the business works and yes um yeah that's why i said god like i feel like god has just put the right people in my life like so in my life um, at the right time because of all the preparation I've done beforehand and I'll tell people sometimes it happens in the like when you least expect it just prepare because it can happen any moment and um, also I'll tell people just network with people because you never know because I've um, one of my strengths I'll say is networking I, I go to different events I reach out to people that I feel even if they can't be of use to me, how I can be of use to them. So just like expand your network um, environment and yeah, um, yeah, and yeah, <laughs> I guess networking that's one, yeah, <laughs> and hard work. Yeah, <laughs> that's one of the things I'm working on now, networking. On a good day, yeah. the visa of the past wouldn't have reached out to you. I would just be like, you know what, I don't know her. Yeah. Mm. But now I always go, you know what, try your best, Louisa. The worst you would hear is no. And you know what? And you can yeah, it's okay. yeah. yeah, and it's okay. Yeah. So what yeah. are some of the assumptions you think a lot of people interested in animation make when going into the business of animation? What are some of the assumptions? Um, that it's easy and because it's for kids, like especially the writing process might be easier. Um, that you make quick money. Um, if you're getting into animation, you have to be ready for at least five to ten years before it takes off and um what i've learned from my co-production partnership deal is like just because you've signed a co-production partnership deal doesn't mean that's it that is the start of it okay. and then there's so many other hurdles to get to where you get commission that's another process in itself even when your show is on that's like they're different processes like they're, it's never ending so just be prepared and have an open mind and i'll tell people that want to that want to get into the animation sector Keep a very open mind. Try not to hold on too tightly to your um, content unless you're self-funding. And even if you're self-funding, um, still you need other people on board with different ideas. Be very open to welcoming people's ideas and have a collaborative spirit because that is how it works in the animation industry. You can't do it by yourself. You need different people to come on board with you. So, yeah. So do you work and, on... Okay, do you work yeah. on or you have a team? So I have a, f a few people that I work with like on freelance basis and then I have like my co-production partners that I bounce ideas off and then I also have mentors that I go to to just kind of get their feedback about industry, about content. Um, like last year we went out to different platforms and pitched. Um, although we didn't go through but it was also a learning experience for me because I was able to get back to some people who were then giving me advice on how to revamp the show. So we're currently in the process of revamping the show based on the feedback and then getting out there again. So yeah. So um I guess persevering, you need to be yeah, you need to have that spirit. And <laughs> you have to have some kind of spiritual being that you believe in because there's <laughs> there are moments that you be like, what am I doing? <laughs> you need that faith to hold on to and just keep going and know that it will happen eventually. Okay. So yeah. So I when I was Googling your name, I, I came across uh, a, a poster organized, I think, by the British Council on how to pitch your story. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I had mentioned that part of my my dream for my series because my series is my series covers a lot of things. I, so I have, uh, not just the children's book, I also have an activity book. The book has a teaching guide. So I'm covering all aspects, many aspects of the African experience, down to even jello fries. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, <laughs> I am doing that. Yeah. So if I was, and my my dream is to have this as a series okay. someday. So how would you, what are some tips you can give if I was going to pitch? Because some people will be listening to it and they'll be thinking, oh, I never thought of actually having my work animated. But for me, when mm. I think, I like to think big. And I remember listening to someone who said, when you dream, dream so big that it scares you it scares you yes <laughs> and when i thought and how the dream started when i thought of writing a children's book i went there nah, i can't do it i went ahead yeah. i did it i had both published then i thought oh get the dolls no i can't it's not possible and then i did yeah. it then i went okay 
So the next thing now is try to see how you can collaborate to get these things animated. So what are some tips you would give me for pitching this work? Well, first of all, I'll ask you why why animation? Like that would be the first thing. Mm-hmm. Why not like to make a series live action with kids? That that would be the first question. Mm-hmm. And then like um because there's, there's so many ways to it. And then how do you because I guess this is where you need like an editorial team to kind of tell you how you how we can translate because you know the way you read a book is different on how you view the view. show and if you notice there's some books like how it's written is so different the direction of it is so different when it's done. I would rather read a book than see a movie I feel, <laughs> I feel movies don't do justice to books it's always watered down like for me who is a voracious reader you see all those books there yeah <laughs> Look, it takes away the imagination. Yes, once I read the book, um, I get I, I like to read the book before seeing the movie because once I see the movie, I get angry because okay. it doesn't do justice to the book. But then you need to also realize which, which direction are they taking it to because some movies, what they do is like they, they, they pick like just like an event within that book mm-hmm. and they take it from there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's um that's yeah, that's the best way, or they'll just take the foundation of the story and then expand on it further. So yeah, I'll say that and then like, what's the hard bit of the show? So I guess, um, yeah, the first thing you need to do is probably work with an editorial team that will help you kind of get to the heart beat of the show. Like, what is it you're trying to do? Why, why animation and why now? That's, okay. yeah, that would be the first few questions. And why that medium? And then you then start putting together like your characters, the world, um, what's, were the themes within the shows like they're different yeah so yeah basically putting together a pitch vibe so with a pitch vibe um so it depends is it world driven or character driven so if it's character driven obviously you need to concentrate like on the characters within that environment within the world and if it's a story with like that's focusing on the world you need to have rich images that um as my one of my mentors said you need to have arresting images <laughs> in no. that pitch bible that really sells your stories or sell your show really well and um then you need to have like a series act because it's like so is your character so let's say you have a main character mm-hmm. is your character with each episode learning something and you start all over again or is it the journey they go through, through each episode so yeah there's so many I think, ways i think for me my characters in each book learn a new thing like in book one they learn about it starts off with a girl being confused not knowing because she has a school project and she doesn't know what to what she doesn't know what to talk about and then she goes to the hair salon and she gets curious about bantu knots and she starts to ask questions and then mrs ojo the hairdresser starts to tell her about the history of african hairstyles and in the end she goes you know what now I'm inspired by this story. I actually want to have Bantu notes so that I can talk about hair. And then the book two is talking about, you know, so she has a brother, so they are twins. So they are on this African safari, yeah, you know, holidays. And then there's a friend of theirs who likes, who is curious about animals. And there they learn that tigers and kangaroos are not indigenous to the African continent. So basically they are learning about animals that are indigenous to the African continent. Yeah, so that's just so in each in each in each book they learn something new. Okay. Yeah. So as you're talking, I was um, like, I was yeah, yeah. picturing yeah. my head. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, because I had to get the right illustrators to work mm-hmm. with, and me being sentimental, you know, like when I was talking about the origins, you know, creation. Yeah. yeah. I had to get the right illustrators. I I worked with Nigerian <laughs> illustrators. The, yeah. the illustrator for this first one. Alaba Onachi, amazing guy. He's in the UK now. Yeah, so he was able to capture the essence of the story. When I was talking about the Orisha Oshu, who was believed to be the best hairdresser that dresser that came from the sky, cornrows, yeah. all of this, he was able to capture it. The second yeah. illustrator too was able to get yeah. well, like the animals the way I wanted them, label yeah. all of this. Another good illustrator. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So I would say uh, 
first of all with this idea you have to be willing to kind of tear it apart and put it back together when you're translating it to a series okay. mm -hmm. the style of the book will be very different to to the animation style mm -hmm. because your your style is obviously a book is static but with animation obviously you need to put into mind like how would the characters look and how would you be engaging to whoever your target audience are so the, yeah there's so many things um yeah to look i can always offer you advice down the line so okay so fantastic. I'm to share my knowledge okay. yeah okay so, so yeah. what are some of the challenges you feel that black animators have because i'm always because when i go online and i check i'm always i'm always happy when i see collaborations like there's this new one i saw yanu yanu with disney yanu it's um I think oh it's, yes yes i was so excited when i it's saw from trigger fish yes i think so yeah. so when i saw that i was so excited so what are some of the challenges you think uh black animators have in regards to collaborating with each other working together to promote their work um well I'm not an animator, so I, will, I can't really speak for black animators, but as, as like someone that owns an animation production company and as a creative producer. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, what did you say your question is? What, so what are the challenges? The challenges they have, you know, working together. Because sometimes, you know, I feel that for other, for the Europeans, many times they have support, they have that backing. So I feel oh, yeah, it's the easier for them. It's, yeah, the foundation is like in publishing. Mm -hmm. There are some stories. Yeah. Stories written by a white author. A story written by a white author is more likely to get picked up than a story written by a black author. Sometimes, depending on the kind of stories. Sometimes, when they say they want black content, you realize that they want a certain kind of black content. Vagon violence, um, absent father. It's all those kind of stories. So it affects your authenticity because sometimes you find that people are writing what will sell and not what they are passionate about. I work from a place of passion. So that's why sometimes people say mm -hmm. that the reason why you're not making money from what you're doing is because you're do you are coming working from a place of passion and not you're not being strategic. Mm -hmm. and you have but, yeah, but I believe in authenticity. Yeah. So how what are the challenges you think? Um, I think I think for us as I totally speak for like us Africans, especially from Nigeria, I mm -hmm. think our challenges start from a young age where art is not seen as a career like other professionals mm -hmm. and i feel like along the way it affects your confidence i'm very blessed and lucky that the moment i told my parents that i wanted to get into this environment like this industry mm -hmm. they've been very supportive from day one so i'm i'm blessed but i know other people that their parents see as a waste of time or even there's some people that i speak to about what i'm doing and it's so interesting the reaction i get from especially like people from nigeria is so different to the people here in the uk because when i tell people in the uk oh i'm running an animation company and this is what i do this is what i plan to do oh wow that's an, an amazing but when i tell some relatives at home oh so you're doing kid stuff it's like kid stuff doesn't carry weight so, <laughs> you know? Why not a doctor so, or a lawyer? Yeah. Or a nurse? Yes, She's like, yes, okay, yes. Why not a nurse? Yes. As, as they say, like we have like I remember I used to tease my friends like top five. So like the top five is like either a doctor, an accountant, an, an engineer, a lawyer, and there's a, like something to do with business. Um so if you're not doing any of those things, you're seen as or you're just yeah, it's just a hobby. So I would say I think our problem truly does start from our communities and also the reason and because of that when you go into those spaces you don't see enough of your kind like there are spaces i've been to and i feel like a unicorn because not only am i like the only black person but the only black woman and it's just it like i've, I've kind of learned to live with it but i always like when i see a black person come up to me or when i see a black person i just i either reach out to them because i'm oh my god you're in this space mm -hmm. so i would say um yeah that in itself i would say is the problem within our communities learning to embrace creativity i know like the music industry and nollywood has tried to kind of make people have more of an open mind but more needs to be done and um i would say some of the problems we have again within our our communities is um we don't have the spirit of collaboration because i feel like um as i mentioned earlier like if you want to go um there's that saying there's that african proverb like if you, you want, want to go, the distance, go alone. Um, if, if you want to go the distance alone, go, if you want to go far go together yeah. Yeah. yeah that's right 
So yeah. I feel like in that um, in, in the animation industry, um, yeah, um, we need to learn to be more collaborative, like have that collaborative spirit and realize like it's better for me to have, because um, I remember someone told me it's better for you to have like half or a quarter of the cake than the whole cake. Because <laughs> a quarter will go far, but the whole, <laughs> you know, you might not go far. Lost. So I would say definitely being able Come again, sorry? No, I said the whole. You might get overwhelmed or you might drown in. <laughs> if it's the yes, whole. Yes, yes. Or you not go far at all. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I would say definitely. I would say it starts with us. Because I've reached that stage where, for me, um, yes, I know the industry hasn't been fair to us. But for me, I'm at that stage in my career where I'm less talk, more action. I reach out to other black creators. There's even another TV series that I'm working on, limited series. I've reached out to another company and we're, you know, trying to put things together. So I would say, um, yeah, um, let's have more collaborative projects together and have an open mind and try and uplift each other, I would say. Yeah, and basically, let's talk more action. <laughs> yeah, I think so let's talk more action. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because and also, that's what I find. That's what I find quite challenging sometimes, yeah. especially when you reach out to other black, other black creatives. I think what yeah. many of them do is before they respond to you, sometimes they go, they check out your profile or they Google your yeah. name or just see what she's done, and let's see if she's worth responding to. I don't know why we do that a lot. I agree that people don't want to waste time; they don't have yeah. time to waste. But I feel that sometimes it helps. Because for me, everybody who reaches out to me, I do my best to respond. Because I just want to know, okay, what does this person have to say? If it's something I can offer help and support, I will. If I is something I, I don't have expertise in, I can always refer you. Okay, please try this person. Have you reached out to XYZ? Reach out to them and just find out. So yeah, I think that is one challenge we have. People who people just feel that you have to be you have to be somebody yeah to mm-hmm. be yeah to be acknowledged like yes, something yeah. something has to be visible in front of you mm-hmm. to be like okay this person is worthy of my time and it's just like but you don't know what the because um what i've noticed and that's one of the reasons why i actually stayed away from social media especially during the pandemic um there are some people that i reached out to who were very active on social media when i reached out to them to do um some work with them i realized that they were not actually as great as what they posted online <laughs> and um so during the pandemic i literally just stayed away from social media i was only active on linkedin and um i was also quite blessed like within my community like pe- people that i kind of bounce ideas of my creatives were exactly the same we all kind of stayed away from social media and within that period that i stayed away from social media i've achieved so much <laughs> Yeah. there's so many things that i've put together that like i'm looking forward to sharing with everybody but i i like yeah um yeah so i guess the point i'm trying to make is just because someone is not posting on social media just because their stuff are not visible on social media it doesn't mean they're not doing the work behind the scenes because that's actually where the work actually takes place so yeah yeah very true so, i think yeah social media yeah. for me i use it to my advantage i use it for business and marketing yeah. some people yeah I, that's what i'm learning yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I've always used it for. I use it to sell my books. I use yeah. it to advertise. Like today, once I'm done t- uh, chatting with you, I'm going to go post my email and say, people, please go ahead and vote. Those are the mm. things that social media for. Social media now is, you know, I ask sometimes, how much is too much? Yes, there's a line that people subconsciously draw and they go over and it's like, I understand it's good to yeah. share work and stuff. But it should be done in a healthy way. Healthy way. And if- but you see, when you think of life, yeah, I've learned that, like a friend of mine will say, when God created you and sent you on your life journey, it wasn't a conference call. No. <laughs> yes, it was just yeah. you and God. Yeah. Yeah. And you look at all these people, you don't know their challenges. They, yes, you don't know what battles people are facing. Battles, behind yeah, them. They just do you stay in your lane. If people get there, in your yeah, if people get there before you, yeah. be happy for them. That's like I say to people: if you arrive before me, yeah. I'm happy for you. I'm still on my way. Yeah, I'll yeah. yeah. I will celebrate with you. Okay, so for me, also being off social media, because I'm a Christian, so being off social media has kind of helped me like 
reevaluate my purpose why is it i'm doing what i'm doing and like how it aligns with god's purpose because i'm realizing that everyone's journey is different and like my mom is always saying not all fingers are equal because if we all had the same journey all our fingers would be equal right so every time i put i just look at my fingers i'm like okay yeah that's right so i'm like god is preparing me for something and my time is just not yet there. yeah but when it comes i hope i'll be in a position to also help other people so that's how i'm seeing it so yeah. like so what i'm doing is bigger than me like yeah rather than make it all about me i'm, so, tell- yeah. I'm yeah. telling you i've been yeah. working on anything new oh yeah um, so as I mentioned earlier, I have a few development in Slate, like um, Slate's in development, sorry. I'm okay. working on like three other shows. And um, it's interesting because I was watching one of your episodes, the lady that wrote Adas Wash Hair. Yeah. Wash Day, sorry. Yeah, Adas Wash yeah, Day. Um, that was a very, yeah, that was a very insightful episode because I'm actually in the process of, I'm, I've got ideas for a children's book. When I heard that episode, that kind of pushed me. I was just like, oh my God. Like, and then also talking about your own experience, how it wasn't perfect, but you still went ahead. And I was just like, I think like God sent you into my life to kind of give me the push that I need. <laughs> because um, yeah, beginning of the day, I've been doing a lot of research, reading, and then the stuff that the lady was talking about researching, um, I guess that's kind of what I'm at that stage right now. And also trying to kind of flesh out my ideas. So one of the things I'm hoping to get into is the um, publishing world of kids books so either relating to the series or a different standalone series in its own so okay that makes yeah that makes a lot of sense because you know sometimes when we sit down and we have dreams um la- yeah. la- i mean last year i was to put out six children's books last year and the illust- all the illustrators apart from this one they all disappointed me my blood pressure um, went up i was oh. in my house which is unlike me i don't usually raise my voice but I was yelling. <laughs> <laughs> I was yelling, yes, because I was working on I was working on classics retelling. So I'm so I I have this project called Bring, Bringing Classics Home. So I am retelling um, the classics Cinderella, Snow White. I'm retelling all those stories, but I'm retelling them in the Nigerian context and celebrating Nigerian culture. Oh, oh that's. Yeah, so th- that's how my brain works. That's how my head works. I have crazy ideas. So I was already doing that, and I had gotten this illustrator to start with the Pied Piper of Hamelin. And I said, it is going to be set in the North, and we are celebrating the North. So give me Northern buildings. If you remember in Peno, all those, um, those, the huts, they are built, yeah, the palace is built, even though it's built with uh, clay. But you see those colors, the Arewa logo, all those yeah. things. Yeah. And that's the metric I, design yes, design. all yeah, those things I asked him. I said, that is what I want to see. Mm-hmm. But I think after all the promises and everything, he wasn't too sure. He didn't really know exactly what I wanted because when he sent me his drawings, I draw better than him. <laughs> <laughs> he sent me his drawings and I discovered I draw better than him. And I'm like, what is this? <laughs> what what is this? Then the other guy. Yes, the other guy, because the other guy just stopped responding. So I was here saying, God, I wanted six books out. God, why is this happening? Why? But later I just said, you know what, Louisa, take it easy. Calm down. You will get there. Yeah, because you will get there. I wanted, when I wanted these dolls, when I had, you know, these dolls, and I was working, trying to work on these dolls, I was just thinking, I need to order a, a thousand pieces. I don't have enough money for that. This, this, this. And I thought when I calmed down, I just said, order samples first. Let's start with samples. Yeah. So you have the samples to show. Yeah. So, so what would you like to see for your mm-hmm. production company? What is the in the future? Oh yeah, what hopes do you well, have for the future? So right now I'm kinda actually reworking on my business. Um so when I first started, um and I think that's why God has kind of slowed me down with my um, production company. Because when I first started, all I wanted to do was just create the animated series. But over the years, the more I learn about the business, the more I realize there's so much potential out there. So for me, I guess um, I'm actually in the process of redoing my business plan. Um, so I would say I'm revamping my company to be more of a boutique IP creation and brand awareness um, company. So basically creating IPs. 
So I do intellectual properties, so be it books, be it TV series or limited series. So yeah, so that that's where I see my company creating content for culturally curious and parents globally. So not just in the UK but globally. So yeah. <laughs> saying that now scares me it's like oh my god <laughs> yeah but that's but yeah but that is that is how it should be the dream should scare you so that if your goal is to reach the sun and you don't get to the sun yeah. you might get to the stars at least it's something yeah 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 and i'm also open um co-production partnership with other people because i've been speaking to one or two other people just out and uh, yeah co-production partnerships so yeah. okay i mean that's great if you know of anyone who is interested in my ideas Please connect me. Anytime you decide you have funding and you want to expand, reach out to me too. Yeah, because for me, I'm interested in... And that's why when I started this podcast, I said, I, I, on, if, you, if, you, if you check our Instagram page, I put there that I'll be chatting with authors, illustrators, people in entertainment, because I think that it's important to diversify entertainment. Because if you go on YouTube, all you find, the diverse entertainment I have found so far are... Bino and Fino, then I think Ubongo. Then, yes, yeah. Yeah, then Toto Taido. I, then then oh, I've yeah, seen a few, yeah, a few others. I haven't seen, but then I haven't seen enough. Because I feel that yeah. when children watch, can watch programs where they see children like themselves, it does a lot. Then for children to who, it, for other children of different cultures, it helps them learn about new cultures. We grew up watching Sesame Street. Yes. Yes. So many other shows. Yes. Ted. I don't really remember Super Ted. Super Ted. Yes. Exactly. Um, let me. See. Sesame Street. He was actually my lecturer at uni. The guy that uh, produced of Super Ted. Oh. <laughs> he ended up becoming my lecturer. Oh my master's my yeah, And the one that kind of get to this where oh I am today. <laughs> Look, you know, when I was growing up, one thing I wanted yeah. to do, and I still have it on my bucket list, is to actually do a voiceover. I always wanted to do voiceovers for cartoons. I don't know why. Someone said, of all mm-hmm. jobs. I said, yes, when I want Little Mermaid, I wanted to be Ursula. They get paid well. They get paid well. Yes. <laughs> I wanted to be Ursula. I wanted to be Ursula. I wanted to be the witch. I wanted to, I always want to be the witch. Oh. Yes. And I still have those dreams. I still have those hopes of doing voiceovers, you know, for cartoons. Um, I remember we had Voltron. Then we had Terra Hawks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we had that. Yes, that's yeah. Ninja, is it Ninja Turtles or something like no, that? No, no, Ninja, Ninja Turtles came later. Ninja Turtles came in the 90s. But in the 80s, okay. yes, in the 80s, there was Thundersub, there was Voltron. Yeah, Voltron was very, very popular because of the uh, the, the five lions and especially the formation. Yeah, that's what made them popular. And um, I'm going to just say to you that, please, if you have any more uh, people in... Um, I mean, who own production companies, who do animation, and are interested in just chatting with me on this podcast, please direct them to me. I really, really like to chat with them because I feel that they have a, there's a lot people can learn from just... Because listening to you, that was why I asked you that question about, you know, assumptions. What assumptions do people have before going into this kind of business? Because for me, when I started yeah, writing these children's books, I just thought that, you know what, Louisa, if you write a children's story... Publishers will be chasing you because you've written an African story. <laughs> By the time I got my first 10 rejections, I just went, you know what, just self-publish this thing. <laughs> For me, it's the other way around because it's like, already I've kind of had my mindset that I'll get a lot of rejections, but mm-hmm. there'll be that one that would change the yes. narrative. For me, that's always been my like my mindset mm-hmm. from the very beginning. Because I knew nobody <laughs> would like what I'm doing or would see the value in it but it'll be that one person or that one um, broadcast or streaming platform that like oh yes I get what she's saying yes we want to come on board like yeah. not everybody Shade so. Smith when I interviewed Shade Smith the lady who wrote um, the book about um, uh, I think that was my was that episode 2 she's mm-hmm. yeah so she said she had gotten a, a lot of rejections then she went back to her drawing board rewrote the story and she found this agent who was interested in representing her. So I feel that that day will come. All my book needs is to fall into the right hand, to find its, its way to the right place at the right time and fall into the right hands. Because the truth is, a lot of stories that get published, 
It's like that. So I just said to somebody, Grace, this is Grace. Her book found its way to the right place. It was at the right place at the right time and it fell into the right hands. And that that is what we all pray for. I just pray that I find that grace and my work finds its way to the right place at the right time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, talking about Trina Manda, actually, she was one of the like I was motivated by her. Mm-hmm. Um, so I remember when I used, I, I also used to work in a call center when I was at uni as a part time job. I remember there was one weekend, I think it was when I was reading her photo for this because that's her first book, right? And I remember, um, she was being interviewed on BBC4 at the time. And I don't know if you've experienced it. So, like, especially if for someone that comes to a new space, like in the Western world, there's a way they speak to you in a very condescending tone sometimes yes. because you don't, yeah, you don't have the accent. But I remember when she was speaking, she had obviously a very strong evil accent. But the way the presenter spoke to her, like, like on her level, and the way she was well, um, the way she spoke eloquently, I was just like, wow. I want to make kids feel like that about themselves, like the way they speak about themselves or the way they see themselves through my work. So mm-hmm. she really kind of, I guess she was one of the people earlier on that kind of motivated me to do my master's degree in animation because I just loved how she was so authentic in that she spoke about her work. It was very Nigerian and there was no condescending tone from the interviewer when they were interviewing her. It was, yeah, it was very natural. And I think the reason why she's probably gone far is basically how she carries herself in a very authentic way. Because if you notice, like even within the music industry, as far like obviously the Nigerian music industry has gone very far. But some of our artists, like they put an American accent, I don't know where they got it from. <laughs> like, but she's I think that's why she's gone far because she's been she's been herself from day one. <laughs> you, know, you see the interesting thing about Chimamanda is I've listened to almost all her talks. Chimamanda is my inspiration for keeping my accent. She inspired me yeah. to do that. I remember when I listened to Chimamanda speak, I said to I just thought to myself, my goal will be wow. to be eloquent, to be articulate. Yes. And then That's when right. I'm speaking to people from other cultures, I pace my speaking. Because someone said to me one time, eh, Louisa, are you sure you are living abroad? You still sound very Nigerian. I said, yes. I speak with a Nigerian accent because I want you to know I come from somewhere. And that and is... And it's a beautiful so, accent. Don't yes. From it. Yes. And Chimamanda did that. Chimamanda did that for me. When I listen to her talk, yeah. I like that confidence. Some people call it arrogance, but I like her confidence. And when I think she, she's just, she knows who she is. She knows who and she I is. think some people, yeah, and she people, is. they find that intimidating because it, it's it's a mirror of who they're supposed to be, but they're, they're not. Be. So yeah, And because own. she's a woman. If she was a man, yeah. I don't think she'd be getting all the backlash yeah. she's getting. I don't think so. Yes. But, so I respect her for that. I listen to her talks. Mm-hmm. It's through her I learned the importance of giving talks in story forms because people remember. That's right. Yeah, you don't just come there, just give a speech, read, read, read. People will forget because <laughs> they'll be bored. But Chimamanda get bored. Tell the story. So, in fact, I'm waiting for her children's book to drop. I think I pre-ordered it. The, I, I, I put up my it's list. No, it's not out yet. It's not out yet. It's not. I think it's coming out in September or so. So that one, that's her first children's book. So she's writing that as Chimamanda, as her name, aka Mwa James, and. I can't remember mm-hmm. how much name. Yeah. But that one I kept, I said, ah, I'm going to read that. Yeah. I really, really like that about her. So, and that's why I've decided, you know what, wherever I speak, wherever, even when I give presentations to senior staff, I still come there sounding very Nigerian. And you, you need to ask, oh, where are you from? I'm from Nigeria. Mm-hmm. Oh, where is Nigeria? Where is <laughs> Africa? Oh, I went to Africa once. What country in Africa? Africa is Africa. Africa. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Actually, as you were talking, like about your book, the hair book, yeah, and like the history and stuff, like I came up with ideas about how you can make it more interesting if you could kind of have like mixed media, like live action and animation together. Okay. And also, thank you for your videos. I'm more, I'm more inspired than ever to write my. I've even started reading. Let me even share. Hope that. Oh, share, share, please share. 
So I've started reading this book because I have a friend that is in the um, publishing. She runs a publishing company, so she right. recommended this. Okay. So it's right. called Writing Picture Books, and it just talks. Of, let me just share with you. Um, so it just talks about um, how to write a kids' book for different age groups, like um, the same here. So yeah, this yeah. As I said, I've just started reading it, and oh my god, I like yeah. It's even making me all excited. Because <laughs> oh, wow. okay. in the space of reading, I've, I've come up with like seven or eight different ideas for my book writing. So okay. it was like all the stuff that she was saying, I was just like, oh my God, like I was so excited because I'm like, oh my God, where have I been? This platform has been around. And because <laughs> yeah. I, I also uh, watched the episode you talked about, the mango one. And I was just like, oh my God, even the way you guys are talking about the mango, I was just like, wow. Like you see the kind of languages that we use is so different that people sometimes don't understand. And that's why I'm like, you know, let's just create our own platforms. Like, I think what you're doing is amazing because you're like exposing people like me to other people and learning about their work and supporting them. Yeah. Authenticity was what, was what I was going for. And yeah. I'm so happy that it's having this impact. And listening to you talking about what you've learned, what you've picked up from the conversations. Because yeah. I was just thinking, saying I wanted a podcast where we could focus on authors and also talk about their books, but focus on authors. Because many times people focus on the story and they forget about the author. Just like when a, a woman, when, like when a mother has a baby, people focus on the baby and they forget about the mom. <laughs> That's what I was going yeah. for. Okay. And then there's another lady that also uh, Naya. Oh, Naya, that wrote um, Mansa, 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 Mansa and Yaya. Yeah, Mansa, Mansa and Yaya. Yeah. 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 And I love the way she spoke. She spoke very confidently about her work. And um, yeah, it's like kind of like how I see myself, like just to like, just get it done. Don't wait for them. Like. <laughs> I am learning, for me, I'm learning every day. I'm yeah. learning to let go of my perfectionist tendencies. When I talk to people about writing, you know, if you refer a writer to me, I ask some questions. When I hear, oh, I want to see how I can make money, I, uh, if I can make money, <laughs> that's it, I'm done. I have nothing to say to you. Because first of all, writing yeah. has a place of passion. It has to come from your heart. Because, yeah. yes, so when it comes from your heart, yes, as much as you want to make money, even if you don't make money in the first, yeah. in the first few attempts, it doesn't hurt as much as when you come, you know, when you come mm-hmm. and you have money driven, you write rubbish. There are people who are money driven, they are writing things in their mind, they are writing. I want what will stand the test of time. If you pick up any of these books 20 years from today, you will learn something new from it. So, those are the things. The only time I reach out to establish authors is for my book club. Like, I interviewed Lawrence Hill last year. You read books, Lawrence Hill is one of Canada's biggest authors to you. In fact, when I interviewed him, I, after that interview, I said, you know what, the year can end now officially. I'm done. Uh, it was so good because it was just yeah. my dream coming full circle because I came across his book 12 years ago and I said, ah, I'd like to interview this man. And 11 years later, it came full circle. I sat down and I chatted with him one on one and I sent him my book. Oh, I have this book, The Book of Negroes. I have it here. Yes, yeah, cool. <laughs> so he's the author. So when I first came, I have, yeah, <laughs> when I visited Canada for the first time in 2011, I came across the book and I went home and started reading it. And I went, ah, who is this author? Mm-hmm. Then when I came back to Canada again, I came across his work and I went, well, let me just try you, these big names. And I was surprised he reached out to me. Very polite man, very refined gentleman. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So thank you so, so much, Zainab. I wish you all the best in... Thank you for having me. Yes, I wish all you all the best too. Yeah, I wish you all the best with your projects. I hope one day you get to work together in the future. All the best.